Good afternoon, and thank you uh, for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Andrew Klump, and I am the Education and Publications Team Manager here at the State Historical Society of Iowa. The Iowa History 101 webinars presented on the second and fourth Thursdays of each month explore Iowa's history from pre-statehood to the current day. Uh, you can learn more about this series and all of our programs on our website at history.iowa.gov. Please remember to sign up for each webinar you would like to attend. And, and don't worry if you can't watch anything live. Presentations are also recorded, and you can always find those on our YouTube page. Um, today, we will hear from Yannick and Smucker, uh, the author of new, A New Deal for Quilts during the Roosevelt Il during the Roosevelt administration's response to the Great Depression, federal programs and grassroots quilt makers alike turned to quilts and quilt making to alleviate the struggles of ec the economic downturn. A few housekeeping points before I introduce our speaker, though. Um, everyone came into this webinar with their with their webinar on mute, excuse me, with their cameras off. Closed captions are available by clicking the closed caption button, which is just at the bottom of your screen. This webinar is also being recorded uh, and will be placed on our the Iowa Culture YouTube page in the next couple of days. So if you want to share it later or return to it, you can do that. The chat function is disabled, but if you have questions, please type those into the Q&A function. It just says a little Q&A at the bottom there for you. My colleague, Jess Runlet, will be watching that feature and will prepare a list of questions that we'll be able to ask our speaker here at the end. Um, but please note, if there's a lot of questions, we may not get to all of them. With that all said, I am pleased to introduce our presenter today. Yannickin Smucker is a fifth generation quilt maker, curator, and professor of history at Westchester University outside of Philadelphia, author of Amish Quilts, Crafting an American Icon, uh, Yannickin lectures and writes about quilts for popular and academic audiences. She hosts and co-produces Running Stitch, a QSOS podcast in partnership with the National Nonprofit Quilt Alliance, drawing on oral histories with contemporary quilt makers. She curated the exhibit, A New Deal for Quilts, an International Quilt Museum at the International Quilt Museum at the University of Nebraska Lincoln, which accompanies the book of the same name. So, with all of that, I am now very, very happy to turn it over to Yannickin to begin. Thank you so much uh, for that introduction, Andrew, and thank you so much. Uh, for the invitation to join you all here today. I'm really excited uh, to have this opportunity to chat a little bit about my book and my research and also really frame it in the context of Iowa. Um, a lot of experiences in the New Deal were very, you know, uh, across the nation, but there's also some, you know, geographic nuances as well. Uh, and so um, I'll be giving you the big picture as well as drilling down uh, into some of the Iowa specific um, content. Um, first, a little bit about me. So as, as Andrew mentioned, I'm a fifth generation quilt maker. I began making quilts when I was a teenager. I was a kid who always liked to have projects to work on and learn to sew. Um, you can see me here working on my first quilt with my, my mother and my grandmother. I grew up in northern Indiana, so I am a, a fellow Midwesterner as well. Um, and then I, uh, you know, as I continued making quilts, I studied history and women's studies in college. And eventually, a couple years after college, I heard about this program where you could study quilts as your academic pursuit uh, at the at the University of Nebraska Lincoln. I thought that's kind of crazy. And then I just kept thinking about it and eventually ended up there at at um, University of Nebraska. Uh, that's this middle photo um, where I worked as the curatorial assistant for what is now called the International Quilt Museum. And it's the largest um, publicly held collection of quilts in the world. And I encourage you to hop on I-80 and, and get over there and check things out if you haven't already. Um, that was also my first real entry into doing quilt specific research. And my very first uh, assignment was interviewing my grandmother, who you see here in the in the lower left slide, um, about her first quilt. And that really changed um, really my whole career and my whole life uh, through those experiences. And now I'm a, I'm a professor of history. I don't get to teach about quilts specifically, but I always find ways to uh, bring my research in, into the classroom as well. 
Uh, so as Andrew mentioned, my first book was Amish Quilts, Crafting an American Icon, and it looks at um, the role of Amish quilts in really the 20th century and how they were, quote, discovered by outsiders uh, and how the value of Amish quilts really shifted as they became art objects uh, instead of objects in a closed religious community. Uh, I've been working for a long time with the nonprofit Quilt Alliance and uh, can check out the podcast Running Stitch, which we use um, oral history interviews with with living quilt makers from these interviews were recorded though during the last 25 years. So they there's uh, a whole range and we use interview clips and then invite some people back to listen to their interviews or invite expert guests to discuss uh, interview clips. It's a very fun, it's, it's quilt history, but we keep it very conversational. Uh, really connecting quilts to contemporary culture in lots of ways. And today, uh, of course, I'll be talking about quilts in the New Deal, um, which is the, the recent book, uh, brand new book and uh, exhibition that is currently at um, the International Quilt Museum. So uh, this is just a promo for that exhibition. It, it is up through April 20. You can also visit the, the website you see on the screen, internationalquiltmuseum.org, to check out the virtual gallery if you're not able to make it in person. Uh, and then the book itself, uh, available wherever you buy books, and I'll, I'll put a link up at the end of the presentation. Uh, lots of lots of the images that I'll be sharing um, today are from from the book. Um, this is just a little overview of the uh, whole um, project uh, here. Um, I argue that the federal government. Uh, perceived and understood the, both the practical and symbolic potential of quilts during the Great Depression. So it really integrated quilts and quilt making into various of its reform uh, and relief projects um, and used them symbolically as well to generate empathy for poor and migrant families. Uh, some of this was drawing on myths of quilt making from the colonial era that, that quilts are all about um, self-sufficiency and using up your scraps. Uh, and some of that is true, but uh, really a lot of that was romanticized in the 19th century. Quilts are really products of the Industrial Revolution. And uh, it's really only once we had the abundance of fabric uh, from industrialization that people began to think about cutting fabric up to sew it back together to make quilts. But during the New Deal itself, during the Great Depression, it became uh, an economic uh, reality where using up all of your old scraps made lots of good sense. I began this project in earnest in the spring of 2020, which was my first sabbatical from the university where I teach. And as you might recall, um, things did not go quite as planned in spring of 2020. And my archival research trips were all put postponed, canceled, um, outside money I had I couldn't use. Uh, and I was really struggling. Um, I tried to get a good start on my research and a lot of what I did was scour um, all of the digitized public domain resources uh, that the federal government and uh, local, local and state governments produced as well, and also benefited from the generosity of lots of um, real quilt history experts, women older than myself who began to send me boxes of research files, typed up their research notes and really made a lot of my research possible. So this picture of 4-H girls from Texas uh, kind of sums up how I was feeling um, back in 2020, um, but yet I, I persevered, right? Um, the perseverance is a, is a common theme of the Great Depression and the New Deal era. And this quilt um, created in 1932-33 by Fanny Shaw, sort of exemplifies that attitude. And it was a little bit of false optimism, uh, this idea that uh, prosperity was just around the corner. Um, those are words attributed to Herbert Hoover. It's unlikely that he actually said that, that, that exact phrase. However, there was a hit song by that name. And, and this quilt, um, which really to me looks like a, um, a graphic novel, exemplifies that attitude that we're soon, if we're patient, if we, uh, we look around the corner, eventually Uncle Sam will show up with, 
with the, the legal beer and the farm relief, uh, um, as we see here, this is just a remarkable quilt. Um, and Fanny's vision is just uh, amazing. And, and she's just one of many, many quilt makers who stitched their hopes and dreams into their quilts um, during the Great Depression. Um, I first kind of became aware of this topic uh, or began to explore this topic because anytime I would need a photograph of an old timey woman at work on a quilt, I could find one in the Farm Security Administration photo archive. And this is one from Scranton, Iowa, the kind of quilt that you, or picture that you might use to illustrate, this is what women quilting used to look like. Uh, this is what a quilting bee is. And I predominantly use these as sorts of photos as illustration until I began to think about the context in which they were created. Um, the Farm Security Administration was one of many New Deal agencies that um, uh, existed during the 1930s, and it was created to um, help farm families sort of, uh, they, could, they offered uh, low interest loans, uh, advice on both homemaking and agriculture. Uh, sometimes they helped people relocate from areas where uh, the farming wasn't good to other other locations. Um, and this was all documented by FSA photographers who were sent out across the country uh, to small towns, to rural enclaves, photograph lots of the, the migrant families who were crisscrossing the country in search of work. Um, but there were a lot of photos like this that are sort of domestic scenes of um, what everyday Americans were, were going through during the Great Depression. However, these photos are very much taken. Uh, I mean, in some ways they are propaganda. This is a government program taking photographs that they were then published in magazines and newspapers and also exhibited uh, at some of the World's Fairs and other exhibitions across the country. Um, and they were designed to build empathy among middle and upper class Americans, as well as legislators who had the ability to um, create programs uh, and fund uh, Americans who and American projects that that needed money. Um, so they were very de much designed to communicate. And as I started to think about what these photographs are trying to communicate, I realized that the, the government is really drawing on this kind of symbolism and the heft of, of American quilts and quilt making as these um, objects of making do as perseverance and fortitude and self-sufficiency. And, and that's what we see. And also the collectivism of uh, something like this, a quilting bee, women gathering to be socially productive as they finish a quilt together. Um, there were a number of photographs um, taken across Iowa, in particular, as part of the Farm Security Administration. And, you know, it's it's funny, we, we still, uh, I'm sure you know, we all think about Iowa State Fair all the time. And so this is sort of a, a trope that already had origins back in the 1930s with the photographs such as these. Um, there's old timey acts like churning butter uh, in Emmett County, Iowa. They also, which I was really delighted as I looked at all of the Iowa specific photographs from the Farm Security Administration, there were also a number of photos taken at Iowa State College, as it was known back then, um, and including this really great one that reminded me of my own time in textile school, uh, learning to identify fibers under a microscope. Um, so the photographers are really capturing the whole gamut of, of, of life in, in these particular instances in Iowa, but this is happening across the country uh, among the, the dozen or so photographers who were very active in this project. Um, and among the photos that were taken uh, were so many, like hundreds and hundreds that feature quilts. So I knew it couldn't just be a coincidence. Um, quilt making was big during the 1930s. Uh, however, um, why would all of these photographers um, uh, embrace quilts as part of the themes of their compositions? There are many photographs of quilters at work at a quilting frame, as you see in this woman in who's oddly quilting in a smokehouse. Um, there's quilts like the or photos like the one in the center where uh, women and children are posed um, with a quilt. There's lots of these sort of look what I made sort of photographs, um, which you know that those are, are posed. They are, the photographer is asking them to pose with a quilt. And then we also see a lot of uh, really lovely um, 
uh, photos that, oh, sorry, my, my slide started advancing um, without my will here. Um, photos of quilts being used in domestic settings, um, as you see the girl doing her homework uh, next to her sleeping sibling. Um, and I really love those domestic photographs in particular because you see all kinds of just everyday quilts on beds, on couches, sometimes being repurposed and in, in ways that are not as bedding. Um, as I began to broaden um, my research, I realized that there were Works Progress Administration, that's the WPA, sewing rooms across the country in every small town and in, in multiple ones in big cities. Uh, and at these um, WPA sewing rooms, which were the largest federal government employer of, of women in relief work um, at that time, um, women who did not have a father or a husband to support them were able to get these jobs. And uh, they um, often were producing garments, uh, lots of mattress making as well with commodity cotton. The price of co cotton had really plummeted during the 1930s. So the government had a lot of extra cotton because it was buying it up. And then it was uh, repurposing it, asking asking these sewing rooms to, to make things with it. And often the quilts that were produced used commodity cotton, at least as the batting. Um, and lots of the scraps that were left from garment making um, were integrated into quilts as well. Here's another shot just to give you more context. Each sewing room is a little different. Um, here we see a quilting frame as well as uh, sewing machines. Some of, um, some of the WPA sewing rooms were very industrial, almost like a sweatshop um, uh, where others had things like, like quilt frames. Sometimes the sewing rooms were even referred to as quilt projects or quilt factories. Um, so there was a lot of quilt production taking place. Um, the government perceived that women would gain new skills that were could be used um, outside of the WPA and in uh, the for-profit sector. However, a lot of that didn't really come to fruition, at least as it relates to quilts and quilt making. And evidence shows that even those uh, women who were employed in producing more industrial uh, outputs, um, garments, and so forth, there really was, it was very hard to transfer out of the WPA sewing rooms into the for-profit industry, even though that was one of the intents. Um, what was really valuable is it gave these women a paycheck, even if it was very small. It's a couple more shots of, uh, uh, well, the, the, on the left is another WPA sewing room. And there's sort of a related project called the Handicraft Projects that many states also had, which um, the WPA sewing rooms produced clothing, quilts, other bedding, uh, and it was all distributed for free to needy Americans. Um, the Handicraft Project had a slightly different model. Um, they were making... Uh, more aesthetically pleasing designed objects. Um, and then th they were sold at cost to state-owned institutions. Um, Milwaukee had the largest and um, arguably most successful, really well publicized handicraft project. And the women there who were called unskilled at the time um, were taught how to produce uh, lots of different crafts, including quilt making and the bedding and Car uh, curtains and other cloth objects that were made then were, were bought at cost uh, by orphanages, hospitals, preschools. So they were used within the state. Um, and other states, including Iowa, turned to um, Milwaukee's project as well, uh, buying goods, but also trying to emulate um, what they, the successes of that project. These are a few actual um, quilts um, that were produced during the 1930s in these various governmental projects. In the center is an example of a quilt um, made by the Milwaukee Handicraft Project. On the left is a, is a quilt that was made from scraps um, from a WPA sewing room. In this case, uh, um, Georgia Mize, who lived in Tennessee, brought the scraps home from the sewing room um, and she and her sister made this really lovely pickle dish quilt. Um, on the left the, is a FARA. FARA was the uh, Federal Emergency Relief Administration, which was the precursor to the WPA. Um, this just is a, one of the rare examples of a quilt um, that actually has its label on it still. Uh, and you can also see it's a, it's a full, this is just a, a detail shot, but the full quilt is, is just a whole cloth quilt, meaning the, it's just one piece of fabric uh, 
machine stitched quilting, very industrial, very utilitarian, which was common of many of the quilts produced by sewing rooms. Um, Iowa did have its own um, handicraft project as well called the Iowa Craft Project. And here's a lovely example of uh, one of the outputs from that craft project. It wasn't as large uh, or as, um, didn't have as, as big a reach as the Milwaukee project did, but many states, um, including Iowa, did have have their own example of handicraft projects, which were which required a little bit more of artisan skills. Again, there are unskilled workers that they're training in these skills, sometimes screen printing, block printing, uh, book binding, all kinds of other crafts in addition to, to working with textiles. During the 1930s, as I've already mentioned, quilt making was quite popular. And as such, there was a grassroots outpouring of quilts made in response to the Great Depression and the New Deal, as that quilt we saw at the beginning by Fanny Shaw, the prosperity is just around the corner. This example is, um, uh, there were many, many quilts that were sent to the White House, to the Roosevelt's as thank you gifts and acknowledgement for uh, all of the efforts the Roosevelt's were making to carry uh, Americans through the Great Depression. Uh, so this example, these are very, what I would call commonplace. These are some of the two most popular patterns during the 1930s, the double wedding ring on the left and the flower garden. And uh, the local newspaper in Pomona, um, California wrote about how these two sisters who were quilt experts sent these quilts to Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, there were lots of quilts sent to the Roosevelt's including many that were marking their uh, Americans' loyalty to various New Deal programs, including uh, the National Recovery Act. It's it's a different NRA than the one that we are commonly think of today. This was a short-lived program, uh, part of the what we call the first New Deal, the first wave of legislation uh, after Roosevelt was inaugurated in 1933. The NRA uh, set forth a lot of both worker protections and consumer protections and uh, employers and producers who uh, signed on to the guidelines of the NRA um, would put this blue eagle logo on their whatever they produced or in their storefronts. And so it was a, a signal to consumers that um, they had good labor practices um, and people were really sought out this blue eagle to affix to everything, as you can see. And there's a number, like dozens of Blue Eagle quilts, and they're each different. So it wasn't just a pattern. There is a pattern, as you see in the left, this very Art Deco representation of a, of a Blue Eagle. But Americans produced um, these NRA quilts in a very grassroots effort because they're all different. They often are using some idea of that Blue Eagle logo. The NRA was found unconstitutional in 1935 and folded and other programs that are part of the second wave of the New Deal, including the WPA itself, also celebrated uh, um, Americans' loyalty to these programs. These are both WPA quilts. You can see in the lower, in the left-hand quilt, uh, in the lower section, uh, applicated words, WPA, USA. Uh, the quilt on the right is a sampler quilt from Oklahoma, where each of the work crews, and I'm not positive if these were construction work crews are working on what kind of infrastructure or they possibly could have been sewing rooms themselves, but each uh, each block is labeled with a cruise number. And um, I, I really love this quilt, seeing it in person, it's hanging in the International Quilt Museum exhibition. Uh, just there's so much care and detail in every block. Uh, sampler quilts are always lovely because they bring together um, the contributions of a number of quilt makers. But again, this is a quilt that's showing loyalty to the federal government's programs. Uh, this is also true of a series of quilts made um, by women who were married to workers of the Tennessee Valley Authority. Um, it was a small group of women who uh, were married to the African-American African men in particular, and uh, the highest empl employed uh, African-American male in the TVA was Max Bond and his wife, Ruth Clement Bond, who had never made a quilt, uh, decided that she was going to design a quilt. And she designed quite a quilt. Uh, as you can see, this is not a conventional quilt at all for the 1930s. She was really more familiar with modernist art. 
Um, and she distributed this pattern to the other African-American women uh, who were living in the villages where the, the various dams were being constructed in the Tennessee Valley. And these do uh, convey loyalty to the TVA, but they also convey some of the tensions. Um, the hand you see pressing against the silhouetted black figure is uh, like Uncle Sam's hand. Is he pulling or pushing? It's hard to tell. And uh, as women in oral histories um, recounted in the 1990s, um, it's the life of leisure is represented by the guitar on the other side. So there's this tension that African-Americans have this moment of deciding, are they loyal to the government or do they want uh, the life of leisure? Uh, do they want these government jobs that the TVA and other agencies were providing? Um, these are a couple other quilts from that series. Um, one that's actually very much depicting a crane and an African-American figure working on a dam. And this is a black fist rising, uh, holding a lightning bolt, which um, is really based on the TVA logo. Um, but there's even speculation that this may be one of the first <laughs> origins of the, the black power fist, because this is power, very much literally electricity uh, rising out of the ground. Um, but these quilts were empowering um, and were intended to convey, particularly to the white administrators of the TVA, that African-Americans had a lot to offer to these programs. There were also uh, in, in the grassroots outpouring of quilts, lots of quilts that made political statements. These are two very different uh, versions of quilts featuring donkeys. On the left, that quilt even in the very small embroidery um, provides the election returns of uh, each of the states that voted for FDR in um, 1936. The other pattern uh, was commercially published by the Kansas City Star. Uh, it's called Giddy Up, a very democratic donkey. There was also uh, a um, elephant uh, of the same sort of design uh, for the GOP. And here are a couple more very political related quilts. These were both given to elected officials. Uh, so it wasn't just the Roosevelt's that received quilts. Um, uh, Minnie Rucker sent this one to uh, the vice president, uh, Garner, um, who was Roosevelt's first vice president, um, uh, ran in the 1932 election um, with a very uh, bold phrase, the eyes of Texas are upon you. Uh, and the quilt on the right um, was given to another senator in North Carolina. And this one also has election returns, like uh, listing each state that voted for FDR in 1932, 36, and 1940. There were commercially available patterns that tried to get in on this celebration of the Roosevelt's and the New Deal as well, including this uh, very highly circulated pattern called Roosevelt Rose. Um, which was published in Good Housekeeping. Every women's magazine, as well as every newspaper, had a quilt column where you could, uh, women could access quilt patterns. Uh, you could send in 10 cents to get a mail order pattern sent to you, but often you could base your own quilts on the images that you saw. Uh, on the right is a really original um, artistic quilt that depicts portraits of Eleanor Roosevelt over the years. Um, uh, it's hard to believe this was created before there was a photo transfer onto fabric, um, really remarkable work. Um, this is another example of a, of a commercially available pattern that's much, very much praising the Roosevelt's. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt, who had polio, often convalesced in Warm Springs, Georgia, which is called the Little White House. And this, this pattern in, is made in celebration of the Warm Springs Foundation uh, in Georgia. One last quilt that really exemplifies the, the grassroots outpouring is this quilt that was made in 1939 at the end of the Great Depression. And just a little anecdote about how this quilt um, entered my consciousness. Uh, it was about two years ago, I was giving a um, recorded Zoom talk uh, for the American Folk Art Museum in New York City. And I was talking about a, a different facet of my research, stuff related to the Federal Arts Project. Um, and a woman uh, saw the YouTube recording and tracked down my contact information and said, asked me if, or she told me that her grandmother had made a quilt that I should definitely feature in my book. Um, the woman, Susan Salser, uh, 
uh, her, her grandmother was Mary Gasperk, who was a Hungarian uh, immigrant, came to Chicago in the first decade of the 20th century, did not have her own quilt making uh, tradition in Hungary that she brought with her, although um, she did have a lot of needlework and embroidery skills from Hungary. Um, but during the 1930s, when quilting became so hot, she saw quilts exhibited as part of the 1933 World's Fair. There was a huge quilt contest it was called the Sears Century of Progress Quilt Contest. And that was her first introduction to quilt making is seeing these quilts. And she became a prolific quilt maker. Chicago's Park Department um, had even quilting clubs set up at some of the local um, local uh, rec centers um, and she was part of this quilting group and made this remarkable quilt um, called Road to Recovery that step by step along the way you can see hopefully this appears um, through your zoom screens uh, 1937 1938 and the the years are marching up all the way up this path um, to the obelisk um, another architecture that was featured in the 1939 World's Fair in New York City. Mary entered this into a contest and I have no idea how she didn't win because this is just such a remarkable quilt. This also is on exhibit at the International Quilt Museum. The family generously loaned it to the museum for this occasion. So another outpouring of, of quilts and quilt making during this time was um, uh, in what I have come to learn are called planned communities of the New Deal. This was one of uh, the real surprising discoveries from my research. There were around 100 intentionally planned communities created by the division of subsistence homesteads. And they were typically um, adjacent to where an industry had shut down. Uh, in this case, in West Virginia, um, it was the mining industry that had really um, collapsed during the Great Depression. So the government came in and took bought land and created a, an intentional community with um, homesteads, uh, small acreage um, for people to subsistence farm, and usually some kind of industry where people could at least work part-time so they weren't just farming. Um, these were designed not for the most destitute of American society, but for people who were more at that middle income level who um, were ha having trouble keeping things afloat and aspired to be homeowners. So it was set up that you could basically have a governmental loan to have your house um, and that you could eventually pay off. And in each of these um, planned communities, there was almost always a community center. And usually that community center had a home economist on staff who led uh, women's clubs, taught classes in quilt making and other um, uh, home management skills, hygiene, uh, child rearing, all of these things. Um, this is probably a post photo, um, but here it's the Home Economics Club uh, in Tigert Valley in this planned community um, working on quilts. There's a couple other examples of these planned communities. There's one in Gee's Bend, Alabama. If you're familiar with American quilts and quilt making, you no doubt have heard of Gee's Bend. Uh, they've made some of the most famous quilts. Uh, they're very graphic um, quilts that have been compared to modern art. Um, G. Spen was first, quote, discovered in uh, the 1930s by New Dealers who came in. It was a former plantation uh, that had since become sharecropping enclave. And uh, it's really, it's in the bend of the, of the river and for many years was very isolated from the rest of Alabama. Um, so it was a really isolated community. But the government came in in the late 1930s and turned G's Bend into one of these New Deal planned communities. And among other things, they set up uh, a home economics room in the school. And these are young women that are part of the National Youth Administration, which was the, the young people's division of the WPA learning to sew. And now G's Bend quilters, I mean, this is the the how it relates to today. Like Target has a collaboration with G's Bend currently going on where uh, G's Bend inspired quilts are produced in a factory in China, but sold by Target. And there's a financial arrangement where women from the G's Bend community are benefiting. Here's another example of a planned community. This also is a segregated community in the rural South. Uh, a lot of the New Deal programs in the South were segregated despite the government's insistence that 
uh, it was providing um, equitably to both um, African Americans and white uh, citizens. They tended to follow what they call the local customs, local culture, which meant uh, sort of this separate but equal um, that was standardized still in the 1930s throughout the South. Um, but I do really love this photo. These are African American home economists working with women in the community. And again, we see a quilt foregrounded. There's a really strong emphasis, as you can see in the caption, on utilizing local uh, materials, corn shucks, uh, flour sacks, um, reusing things in order to make uh, the handicrafts. Uh, and this is one last photo um, before we get into a very Iowa specific part of. Um, of a, an Iowa specific planned community. And there are also migratory labor camps. And these were set up by the federal government, mostly on the West Coast of the United States. So if you recall, uh, lots of Americans were migrating uh, West because of the Dust Bowl and other environmental conditions, just in search of work, often in search of migratory uh, agricultural work. They were migrant farm workers. And when they were living in what were called Hoover towns, which are like shanty towns essentially, or pea pickers camps that were very much haphazard tents that families were living in, the government wanted to step in and provide these migrant laborers with more um, substantial housing. So these were also planned communities, ostensibly temporary, but they too were, they were designed by architects. They always had a community center. They always had a home economist on staff and sewing machines and quilting frames. The woman on the left is carding cotton. Um, carding is the process of straightening the fibers. Uh, if you think of a, a fuzzy cotton uh, that comes off the, the cotton plant itself, um, the cotton needs to be, uh, the fibers need to be straightened in order for it to be used, whether it's going to be spun or in some other capacity. Um, but the women here at this camp were parting the cotton in order to use it as um, quilt batting. So uh, this brings me to one of the most successful New Deal communities across the country, Granger Homesteads, which you may be familiar with Granger, Iowa. It's uh, um, north of Des Moines. Um, at that time in the 1930s, uh, Granger was a coal mining community that was uh, suffering hard times. And the families who worked in the coal mines largely lived in, in coal mining camps, uh, you know, kind of a company town sort of situation, but without a lot of amenities. Um, and as the coal uh, industry was sort of collapsing during the Great Depression, uh, these families were really struggling. And uh, so the Division of Subsistence Homesteads was founded in 1933 during uh, Roosevelt's first year in administration. And there was a, a recent, uh, Recent transplant to the area, Father Luigi uh, Lugutti, um, who heard about this program and uh, thought it would be a really great way to bring some of the um, values. He was involved in the National Catholic Rural Life Conference. So uh, Catholic uh, farmers uh, really praising the rural life, almost drawing on what we think of as Jefferson's a yeoman farmer ideal, that, that the United States should be a nation of small farmers. And and what Luguti and, and Jefferson before him like valued was that they would be subsistence farms so that people could take care of their own families with the, the products that they could grow. Um, uh, Luguti, who came to Iowa in 1926, he said, quote, help a man get land and he becomes a capitalist. If a man has a cow, he doesn't become a communist. So there is also this very heavy sentiment, which was common throughout much of the 20th century that uh, uh, Catholics had a very strong uh, anti-communist um, sentiment. And even though uh, Liguti helped found this collectivist <laughs> planned community, he too uh, wanted to impart these capitalist values um, on the people who lived there. He said one foot in land and one foot in industry. So the families that moved to Granger um, the fathers, the adults would still work part time in the mining industry or in other industries, but then they would have small uh, plots of land, uh, homes that they could be paying off loans on to eventually own themselves. And uh, so, so Luguti, when he heard of this division of subsistence homesteads, 
He pitched a plan for one to be created in Granger, and that proposal was approved in 1934. Uh, he had to relinquish some of the uh, local control because this really was a federal operation. You know, the federal government comes in and buys this land and uh, built, creates small plots for the subsistence farms. Um, Granger had uh, 50 homestead plots, and they were each from about two to eight acres. Most of the selected families, and there was an extensive application process, um, came from the local mining community, and, uh, and they they continued to work part time. Uh, but Laguti uh, really encouraged these other occupations and vocations, including uh, rabbit farming, which was was one of the things he he viewed as a as an answer to the ills of. Uh, uh, that that these families were facing and and other forms of subsistence architecture or, or agriculture as well. Among the families who initially lived in Granger homesteads were eighteen Italian family immigrant families, eleven Croatian immigrant families. Uh, most of the families were Catholic. Um, there are around two hundred fifty individuals uh, that li lived in this planned community during the nineteen thirties and. Many spoke very little English. Um, Laguti ran uh, a parochial school that was off the community. There was still a separation of church and state, but he he was, uh, you know, the um, priest of the local parish and ran the, the local Catholic school where many of the children from the community attended. And uh, Laguti really promoted the, the values of thrift and cooperation. Uh, in fact, there were co-ops uh, on the community as well, which shared um, farm implements and also allowed uh, farmers to find markets for the products that they were making. And these were also values that were shared by the National Catholic Rural Life Conference of which um, he was a, a, a leading activist. Um, Granger, as well as some of the other planned communities across the country, had a strong emphasis on handicrafts in particular. Um, there was a belief that Laguti shared that um, that being able to make things with your hands was, was almost a moral imperative. Uh, in some of the other communities, it was much more of a um, vocation. Uh, some of the communities that were in Appalachia, the, the weaving, uh, the rooms were essentially weaving workshops that, that the goal was that people would learn how to weave and then they could transfer those skills outside of the community into industry. The extent to which that really happened is hard to say, um, but regardless, making something with your hands lifts the morale as well. And when uh, during the Great Depression, it isn't just the economic downturn, it is a downturn in morale that is happening nationwide. And so being able to make things with your hands, uh, sometimes in conjunction with your, your neighbors, um, was really viewed as a positive trait. So none of these pictures uh, are of quilting per se, although we do see some carding of wool, um, very much a similar activity that we saw in that um, a uh, migratory labor camp. And we also do see a loom at work in the um, very far right hand photo. But there was quilting at Granger. And so these are photographs um, from the community center. This is the women's club and they're making a quilt. And I really love seeing these photos. I mean, these fit sort of that original um, discovery I made of like, why are there so many governmental photos of women making quilts? And now that I know a lot more about Granger, I think, well, what language are these women speaking? If they had come from Italy or Croatia, they wouldn't have come with their own quilt making traditions. Uh, they would have um, very much, uh, quilt making would have been new to them. Uh, this is a very typical quilt pattern from the era, double wedding ring, uh, lovely pattern. But I, I just, when I see a, a picture of, a, of women around a quilting frame, I always want to know what they're talking about. I wish we had recordings of this as well. Quilting bees are this mythologized romantic idea um, really born out of the 19th century. Already in 1843, there was a Godey's Women's or Godey's Ladies magazine called the quilting be old fashioned. So already in 1843, it was an old fashioned idea, but it was one that was perpetuated because it is so romantic. Why wouldn't you want to sit around with your friends at a quilting frame and 
gossip and talk as you uh, productively finished the stitches on a quilt. Um, this is called the Women's Club. And like many of the other planned communities, the home economists would have come in and helped create a women's club, facilitated those meetings. Um, probably the women uh, engaged in other forms of mutual aid as well. They're at some of the labor camps on the West Coast. Uh, there was women's groups who made sure that every new family to the camp had a quilt. Um, they would make a quilt for every new family. There was one camp in particular that even allowed families to check out quilts like you would check out books from the library. Again, mutual aid designed to make sure everyone had the bedding they needed. However, you know, quilts are elaborate bedding. You wouldn't need a, a, your bedding to look uh, as beautiful as this quilt. So quilts straddle this line between being utilitarian objects, but also being these very sentimental objects all the comforts of home are embedded in the idea of a quilt. And also they're beautiful, well-designed objects, as you can see here. Uh, I'm gonna show one other photo of the women's club just to emphasize that probably these photos are in fact staged to some degree. Um, this is supposedly the meeting of the women's club taking place uh, in the community center as well. Uh, it feels very kind of stilted, very posed that harsh light, the women, the woman with her uh, finger uh, wagging, another woman taking notes. To what extent this is a real scene, it's hard to say, but uh, it does emphasize that this community center was, was used by the women of uh, Granger, and we do know that they made quilts as well. I would love to know much more about the quilts and quilt making in this community, so if anyone has leads on those uh, sorts of uh, activities, please do let me know. I'm going to close with uh, this last photo, which is that same ubiquitous double wedding ring quilt. Um, there were lots of other manifestations of quilts and quilt making in the New Deal projects, including in the Federal Arts Project, which was a very large um, program started in 1934 um, that hired unemployed, out of work artists, whether they were graphic artists, illustrators, painters, muralists. Uh, as well as a lot of other white collar workers. Um, in conjunction with the Federal Arts Project was this uh, kind of predated a little bit, the uh, Treasury Department's Public Works of Art Project. So a lot of the murals that you might be familiar with from post offices, those were funded by the Treasury Department rather than the Federal Art Project. But here again, this is an Iowa artist and we see the same kind of scenery. I mean, this looks almost the same as uh, these women sitting around stitching on that same pattern. Uh, so I really loved uh, love this photo, uh, or it's a, a painting, It's mine is a reproduction of the, that painting, uh, illustrating again, that very romantic ideal of the quilting bee. And the quilting bee, whether it's real or imagined, um, I think exemplifies a lot of that uh, mutual aid that was necessary and sought out during the Great Depression as well as this collectivism that we see represented by the planned communities such as Granger Homesteads. Um, I am going to wrap things up here. Um, this QR code, um, I don't know, it looks like it might be coming off the screen a little bit. Um, I can adjust that. Um, we'll lead you to my website where you can find a link to order the book, although you can certainly find that uh, through any online bookseller as well. Uh, but I've got lots more photos um, in addition to the ones that you've seen here on that website. I'm going to stop my share and I think we'll have some time for questions. Uh... Well, thank you so much, Yannickan. That was a really wonderful overview of quilts and the New Deal. And you showed us so many beautiful images of um, people really doing their best in what was undoubtedly a very rough time. And I just want to mention one more time before we get into questions that the Quilts in the New Deal exhibit at the International Quilt Museum in Lincoln, Nebraska is showing through April 20th. And it's a great opportunity to see many of these quilts that Yannickan shared today. We have time to answer some questions. We've got about 10 minutes. And as a reminder, if you have a question, please submit it through the question and answer feature on Zoom. 
please note, we may not get to all of the questions. Our first question comes from a viewer in Denmark today. And I, I presume that is Denmark the country, not Denmark the small town in Iowa. She has a question about the mythification of patchwork quilts in early quilt studies and in the general public and your views on that, Yannickin. Why do you think that quilts and quilting as a phenomenon and tradition have become such a strong symbol in American culture? Is it possible that the patchwork quilt and the stories they tell about American ingenuity, creativity, and the making do mentality symbolize a strong belief in the American spirit or identity? Uh, I love this question. And uh, yes, I, I do think quilts sim symbolize a lot of that. Um, and some of it very much is mythologized. So again, like if we are looking back to people like to say quilts have always been made or Americans have always made quilts. And um, those are, that's painting with a pretty broad brushstroke. Uh, colonial era women, some made quilts, but very few did. Before the industrial revolution, textiles were the most expensive things that a home would, a, a household would own. And uh, they would be used and used and used, but um, typically, really worn fabric does not hold up in a quilt. Um, the earliest colonial era quilts that we have are really high style quilts. They are quilts of the leisure class, not quilts of making do. Um, so I just wanna emphasize that some of this is very much mythologized. And then as the industrial revolution, really by the 1840s, there's a lot of um, abundant cheap printed cotton available and people begin buying new fabric to cut up to make quilts uh, around that time period. And uh, while many of the quilts that survive are these kind of more high style quilts, there probably were also um, more everyday utilitarian quilts as well. Um, but I just wanna emphasize that this, this mythology is already growing through the 19th century. Already by the 1840s, 50s, 60s, people are looking back at the colonial era as, as when, when quilt making really had its origins, um, yet they are imagining uh, the colonial foremothers like scrimping and saving and, and uh, reusing every little bit of fabric, yet we don't have quilts that actually is, exemplify that. Um, by the early 20th century, we're in what is called the colonial revival. And this is exemplified not just in quilts and other decorative arts, but really in architecture and in the values where it, industrialization and increasing modernization, urbanization has made people look back nostalgically on, a, on an imagined past. And quilts are part of that past. Quilting bees are part of that past. Um, so quilts indeed really in the early 20th century become this symbol of American culture, American uh, creativity, American perseverance and fortitude. And all of this really does exemplify the this sort of American spirit that Nina is, is asking about in her question. So to some extent, it doesn't matter if it's myth or real. By the 1930s, it becomes real because then uh, women, American quilt makers believe that it's true and they have the economic uh, need to scrimp and save and use their feed sacks and recycle their garments and and uh, tobacco labels and everything else that becomes part of uh, a resource for making quilts. Um, so some of it is built ba based on myth, but it becomes a reality by the by the time of the Great Depression. And since that time and the decades since, I think we it's only grown. We still have a strong belief that quilts exemplify a lot of the American spirit that really rose up prominently during the 1970s at the time of the American Bicentennial. And I think we're having a really strong quilt revival moment again right now. It's a really thorough answer to that question. <laughs> Thank you so much. And now, now we have a shorter question that I think will have a more brief answer. And that is, where can we find a link of the virtual tour that you mentioned, or could you email that so we can include it in the follow-up email that will go out to all attendees? 
Well, I will put it in the um uh, in the chat right now. Um and and Jessica and Andrew, you can um distribute that. Um I don't think I can I'm not sure if I can text to everyone. Let me see. No, I can send it to everyone. Uh I have that ability. So you can all um find that link to the International Quilt Museum in Nebraska and learn more about the exhibition and and do the virtual tour. Thank you. Thank you. And then we have another attendee wondering, did you find any themes, patterns, or colors that seem to be especially prominent in Iowa or originating in Iowa in your research? Or just more generally, is it people were making that double wedding ring quilt more in certain sewing rooms than other sewing rooms? That's a great question. And hi, JC. So nice to see your name on the screen. Uh, we know each other from the oral history community. Um, um, I did not see specific Iowa kind of regionalism in terms of quilts and quilt making. I think in part that's because this is right around the same time period when a lot of those regional distinctions uh, really start to become lessened. And that's in large part because of the ubiquity of commercially circulating quilt patterns. Every small town newspaper had um, a quilt column. And these were syndicated. So uh, the quilt column is being written by someone in New York City, like using a pseudonym like Laura Wheeler. And uh, and the patterns are being distributed nationwide. Um, and these patterns are often, it was very interesting to see how the language uh, describing the patterns, they'd be like, here's thrift or dig into your scrap bag. Um, it was very much promoting these, these thrifty values of the Great Depression. However, many of the actual quilt designs were were quite modern and um, and cheery. There's a, a phrase that my my mentor Mary Kay Waldvogel, who's a who's a quilt historian, uses um, it's the title of her book, "Soft Covers for Hard Times." So these very cheerful quilts that were uh, many times were quite modern designs. They're not using old fashioned nineteenth century designs. Maybe a little bit of inspiration from the colonial revival, but um, we see quilts like like the double wedding ring over and over and over again, the Dresden plates, similar kind of pattern where you can, it's ideal for using up a lot of scraps, but at the same time, it, it is a very modern um, pattern for the 1930s and one that's circulated across the country. We saw an image of a double wedding ring in California. Uh, we saw, you know, the examples from Iowa, but it was also uh, all across the country. Um, I'm sure if I spent a lot more time in Iowa and looking through the um, uh, the blanket chests of, of Iowans, there might be some more nuance to very favorite patterns that were found in this region. Um, but I think what's really happening is there's a lot of just sort of um, minimizing of regionalism that starts to happen mm -hmm. in the 1930s. That's the minimizing of regionalism as quilting goes nationwide in the 30s and on to Flickr in the early 2000s and Instagram right. today. That's right. We have two minutes and I think we can get to two questions in those next two minutes. Let's so do it. The, let's do it, Yannickan. And about pointing out today, quilts are used as decorative wall hangings. Do we have any evidence that people use small quilts to be decorative instead of only making quilts as utilitarian objects during the New Deal? Absolutely. And um, part of it was um, almost by necessity. Um, I'm going to quickly find a um, this great photo of, um, uh, I'm not sure if I can find it fast enough or not, um, of of a of a quilt hanging in a doorway, I might not be able to to, to pull it up uh, in time to show you, but um, you can find it on on my website very easily. Um, there's a quilt hanging in a, a doorway in a very temporary living quarters uh, where some migrant farm laborers are living, and I love that photo because it shows how quilts were used in domestic spaces, not just as bed covers. Um, some of the TVA quilts that I showed earlier in this presentation are really small scale. So they're just like something that could hang on a wall. Um, 
I wouldn't say that uh, it was as ubiquitous as it is today. Lots of, of quilts that are made today are intended for walls, intended as art objects. But in many of the accounts that I read, like of a, a visitor coming to one of these New Deal planned communities, they say the women decorate the, their homes in lots of needlework. And so I can only presume that some of that needlework is probably also quilts. They might be on beds. Um, probably some also on walls. Uh, art quilts as a larger genre really don't emerge until the 1970s and 80s on a larger scale. However, um, there is a lot of interest in the artistry and original quilts uh, begins to, to spring up during the 1930s, sort of on the opposite spectrum of the double wedding rings that everyone is making are quilts, very original quilts, often like the Road to Recovery quilt or Fanny Shaw's quilt, Prosperity is Just Around the Corner, where um, it's an artist, it's artistry for sure. I don't know always if those quilts were hung um, on walls. Uh, I do know some quilts were displayed in like department store windows that would have been hanging uh, as well uh, in conjunction with some of the world's fairs and some of the quilt competitions. So there is this emergence of quilts as aesthetic art objects for sure. Absolutely. And then our last question hopefully will be a quick question. Of all the quilts you researched for your book, which one sticks with you the most and why? Well, um, it is uh, probably that Road to Recovery quilt, which I uh, showed you. Um, it's just such a remarkable story because uh, an immigrant woman uh, without a quilt making tradition of her own, uh, it's part of her American identity that is really forging as she learns to quilt in Chicago. And the the handwork on it is just exquisite. She was a, an amazing uh, both artist and artisan. And uh, I just feel like the end of the depression coming, you know, when we see that quilt, we are on the road to recovery. On, on the road to recovery. And it's really just so special that her family knew that quilt was special and cared for it so well, so we could all still enjoy it today. Absolutely, Jess. And with that answer, we will bring this webinar to a close. And I did want to remind anyone who is local to the Des Moines Metro, there are some quilts and textiles on exhibit at the State Historical Museum of Iowa, which is free and open almost every day in downtown Des Moines. Thank you to everyone who joined us today, and we would like to extend one last thank you to Yannickin for this wonderful presentation. It's been my we pleasure. Hope we hope everyone will sign up for future Iowa History 101 webinars that take place on the second and fourth Thursdays throughout the year. There are many great stories to tell in the upcoming months. For more information and to register for future webinars or to watch recordings, check out our website at history.iowa.gov. Looking to learn more Iowa history? You can find and watch over 50 recorded webinars of past 101 programs on the Iowa Culture YouTube channel. And of course, today's program will also be added. We look forward to virtually seeing you for the next Iowa History 101 webinar on February 22nd. The topic will be A Portrait of Glenn Miller. Thank you all again for joining us today and have a great afternoon. Thank you.